Issue 2 begins at a Japanese nightclub. Stop! You must be super cool to proceed! Your life depends on it! Damn it! I'm only ultra cool! When will I level up? Here, we're introduced to the Super Young Team, a Japanese team of superheroes that are basically Grant Morrison's modern take on the Forever People, a group of young new gods who basically acted like hippies. In this case, it seems to also be a kind of weird take on Japanese pop culture, taking elements of other works and making it uniquely their own. The Super Young Team appropriated symbology of American heroes and contrasting it against their own unique pop culture heroics, like Sentai and Kaijus and etc. They only have slightly more impact on this book than Anthro, because Final Crisis really should have just been called Grant Morrison's Big Book of Ideas. See, unlike Rob Liefeld, Grant Morrison has the imagination to pull off creating dozens if not hundreds of unique characters and designs and can write a story for them. It's just here he clearly has too many ideas and not enough time to do anything with them. Slightly more important is a celebrity fighter named Sunny Sumo, who was also associated with the New God stuff, being met by Mr. Miracle Shiloh Norman and his Mother Box. And for some reason here it's called Mother Box with three X's. Because poor literacy implies incest porn. What the hell? He basically says that the mother box is the only surviving thing after that war Darkseid mentioned. The war that evil won. For some reason, the powers of evil are now walking on Earth, and he wants to put a team together to fight them. Our team will be as legendary as Donna Troy's during the Infinite Crisis. While Nick Swoton describes his weird dreams to the workers at the fast food joint he works at, Dan Turpin apparently survived his encounter with Boss Darkseid and is now beating the snot out of a Mad Hatter, who tearfully admits that he designed prototype mind control helmets for the Darkseid Club. Who knew the sound of breath whistling through smashed cartilage could be such a turn-on? Okay, between this and the Mother Box name, maybe we should have actually called it Grant Morrison's Big Book of Fetishes. After the Mad Hatter admits that the kids were taken to the Bloodhaven ruins, I will admit there's one really good bit of art and foreshadowing as Turpin looks into a mirror, the cracks on it laid over his forehead. The Martian Manhunter's funeral is held on Mars, with Superman giving his eulogy. We'll all miss him and pray for a resurrection. Well, prayers answered a few years later after Blackest Night. Admittedly, I don't think the prayers included first resurrected as a Black Lantern zombie, but beggars can't be choosers. Back with the Secret Society, Lex says that he's still not convinced about Libra. He'll only be impressed if Superman is taken out of the picture. Then, over to the Justice League, Wonder Woman has some more awkward dialogue. John Jones is dead. Orion is dead. The Justice League no longer has access to the instantaneous mind-to-mind -mind contact Jean's telepathic skills provided. I mean, yeah, two friends and colleagues I've known for years have been murdered, but what really matters is we don't have his cool superpower anymore. Like, geez, it not only is an awkward thing to say, but coming from Wonder Woman especially feels wrong. But in any case, the Alpha Lantern arrives, named Kraken, who immediately goes about insulting Hal Jordan, the Justice League, and everything else around her, particularly the primitive technology that they need to use to ascertain Orion's cause of death. However, Batman being Batman, he's already figured it out. A bullet wound. Well, sort of. There's internal trauma indicating a bullet went through his skull, but there's no entry or exit wound. However, we soon see Jon Stewart discover the bullet, made of a material called radion that's toxic to the new gods. The weirdness, though, is that the bullet has been buried in the concrete foundation of the pier for over 50 years. Unfortunately, the cool, bizarre murder mystery takes a swerve when Jon is then attacked by another Green Lantern, identified by Kraken as Hal Jordan, who's taken into custody. Batman is the one who doesn't buy it. Look, I was never Jordan's biggest supporter, but this just doesn't scan. I mean, look at who's accusing him. Are we sure she didn't just unleash herself or something? He goes to confront Kraken, who reminds him about Hal being taken over by Parallax, but then she has a momentary headache and yells at Batman, Help me! She's eating my mind alive! Tell them our weapons don't work! Realizing that she's under a form of mind control, Batman calls for help and tries to stop her, but she's able to subdue him. Did you think the gods would tread lightly when they came among you? Well, hiding in someone else's body is not really a walking around drawing attention sort of move, so... In Bloodhaven, Turpin evades the Atomic Knights riding on the backs of warrior Dalmatians. Yeah, check out my Battle for Bloodhaven review for that story. And is led by a reverend who happens to be there into the command debunker. 
However, it's not the Atomic Knights occupying it, like it was at the end of Battle for Bloodhaven, but rather Darkseid's forces. Turpin can't focus on anything, failing to remember even that he encountered the kids he was looking for already at the Darkseid Club. We, sir, are the gods of Apocalypse, manifesting in all our bleak majesty to bring about the final crisis of man. We have a title! And frankly, it feels very lackluster when you recall that the previous two crises were about more than just humanity. Turpin is brought to a lab where artificial bodies are being constructed, a huge tiger-like creature on a slab, while Batman is locked into some kind of device that starts injecting him with drugs. And over to the Daily Planet, Clayface imitates Jimmy Olsen, and plants a bomb that devastates the offices. Superman survives, of course, but Lois is buried under some rubble. Then over to Wally West and Jay Garrick, who arrive at the Central City Community Center, which has since been turned into a disused strip club. This is the place where the Martian Manhunter was killed, and they discover a replica of Metron's Mobius chair, no doubt the one found at the dump. According to Wally, the Mobius chair, replica or not, lends credence to a theory Batman had about the bullet that killed Orion. What if the bullet was fired backwards through time? Now there's a conspiracy theory about the Kennedy assassination I haven't heard before. When they touch the chair, it seems to emit lightning and electricity, confirming that it's really the genuine article. Wally theorizes that the chair is actually the scope of a higher dimensional gun. Well, that's a nice feature and all, but does it have a built-in cup holder? The chair begins to vibrate and send out noise, and Jay Garrick recognizes the vibration. Issue 2 ends with Barry Allen chasing the bullet that killed Orion and screaming for the two to run while he himself is being chased by the Black Racer. Yeah, this is one of those points where the book lost me. Barry had a good death. There is no reason to bring him back to life when Wally filled his shoes for an entire generation of people, and arguably better than him. But yeah, let's move on to issue three. Agents of the organization Shade, including the character Frankenstein, we'll be getting back to him again soon, don't you worry, arrive at the former location of the Darkseid Club, finding the desiccated body of Boss Darkseid, as well as the Question, who's trying to locate Dan Turpin. She evades them while, uh some kind of digital projection of a computer mouse cursor in finger form, writes out the words, no evil in the air. Oh great, now even Microsoft Office has been possessed by Darkseid's forces. And then a Nazi Supergirl crashes in the middle of the street. Yeah, I'll explain that a bit later. The result of this is that some agents manage to grab Montoya. But enough of that, Nick's Wotan is getting fired from his job at the fast food place because he keeps asking weird questions to customers. I just wondered if anyone else felt the Graviton impacts increasing. Gravitons? Even the word is disgusting! Ew, Gravitons! Icky! Nearby on a TV, Nyx notices that a cave painting has been unearthed, the one Anthro was making in the distant past. Anyway, Jay Garrick recounts to his family, Wally's, and Barry's former wife Iris what had happened after Barry reappeared. The three Flashes did their best to try to stop the bullet, but failed. Wally was able to keep up with Barry, but Jay fell behind and had to retreat back out of the time stream. It's a little known fact that death can't travel faster than the speed of light. Of course! Don't you know anything about science? Meanwhile, at the Legion of Doom... Yeah, no kidding. A little cameo by the Legion of Doom Darth Vader helmet based thing. But anyway, Libra has brought the human flame there and is providing him with a new uniform. He's a little reluctant though, especially when he hears a voice coming from inside the helmet. Libra shoves it on his head. A voice? What is it saying, Mike? Listen close. Eh? You hear it now, Mike? You will listen to my self-help tapes, Mike! You will listen! No, the voice is speaking the anti-life equation, and he immediately becomes pacified. Lex Luthor arrives. Superman hasn't responded to an emergency call in 18 hours, meaning somehow Libra has managed to do something to keep him occupied. Naturally, Luthor is not happy about this. See, someone with that kind of power is a threat to him. Unfortunately for Luthor, he didn't really come prepared, as he and his guards are surrounded by others wearing similar helmets to the human flames. They're called Justifiers, the helmets repeating the anti-life equation into their minds to subdue them. Judge others. Enslave others. Anti-life justifies my hatred. Man, where are Peter Frampton and the Bee Gees when you need them? Libra informs Luthor that in 24 hours, the human race will be completely and totally subjugated, so he has a choice. 
Either get a Justifier helmet on his head, or renounce science, swear an oath on the Bible of crime, and pledge your service to the master of all evil. Although before you choose, please be aware that the Justifiers have a better health plan. It's a balancing thing. So where is Superman? He's right at Lois' side at the Metropolis Hospital. She's alive, but only just barely. He mentions that his heat vision is the only thing keeping her heart beating. Not sure how that works, but yeah, she's also in immense pain despite her coma, and he whispers that he'd do anything to take that pain away. And that's when Zillow Valla shows up to tell him she can do that. I offer you one ultimate chance to save her, but we must leave this world now before it's too late! Also, may I borrow five bucks for bus fare? The Alpha Lanterns transport Hal back to Oa for trial, much to the irritation of the remaining League members. Wonder Woman is convinced that Darkseid is involved, but the new gods are dead or missing, and they can't even rely on normal human agencies like Checkmate, which has been reformed since Infinite Crisis, to assist since they're too busy investigating what's going on in Bloodhaven. Without their knowledge, their warriors and technology, we'd be at a frightening disadvantage. We'd need to start training an army. That gives Green Lantern Alan Scott an idea. Did I ever tell you how President Roosevelt helped us assemble over 50 mystery men and women as the All-Star Squadron so quickly back in the war? Bake sale! No, it's Article X, the draft for superheroes. And thus they initiate this draft, with Oracle acting as their new coordinator, what with John dead, a bunch of superheroes getting rallied together at the Hall of Justice, and... It's really unimpressive. I don't know, seeing a massive gathering of heroes should be awesome. It always is in the other crises, but this? It's just so flat and cramped. When we see these kinds of shots, it's from a distance, showing a big wide space and filled with as many characters as they could, usually on a two-page spread because there are just so many. But this, it's, it's only a splash page and everyone's standing so close together and we have no sense of scale as to how big this room is. I really want to know who dropped the ball here on this. Morrison only scripting it for one page? J.G. Jones not knowing how to do a shot like this? Or an editor who didn't know how to trim the script so that they could get a two-page spread? Take your pick. Or pick all of them. It's possible they're all at fault. Anyway, Mr. Miracle tells Sonny Sumo about the end of the Seven Soldiers mini. How he died, but came back to life three days later. I mean, I guess you could say Mr. Miracle is another name for Jesus. They're attacked by more of Darkseid's justifiers, but are rescued by the super young team and fly off. Wonder Woman heads out to Bloodhaven to help with the investigation there, accompanied by the Atomic Knights. We get better Wonder Woman dialogue here, as one of the Knights mentions how much she's been an inspiration to her, and Wendy of course notes how she's proud to have her at her side. They come across some dead bodies, other Shade operatives, and the one who killed them, Mary Marvel, now decked out in leather with her hair reduced to two pink pigtails. Yeah, this was what the bit from Countdown was supposed to be leading to with Mary's turn to evil. Spoilers, she did not become evil in this of her own volition like in Countdown. Although if there's one thing I do want carried over from Countdown, it's Mary Marvel using Kyle Rayner as a club to beat people up. That was hilarious. She attacks, killing one of the knights. Wendy manages to temporarily subdue her, but she reveals how the new gods have been hiding in human bodies. This is kind of another artistic fail. The way the panels are laid out and this revelation to Wonder Woman, it feels like this is supposed to be some major shocking moment, but we've already seen Darkseid and his crew inhabiting bodies, so it's not really a reveal. She also says that Wendy is too late. In five minutes, the anti-life equation will be spread across the globe in various forms. Wonder Woman now acting as a carrier of it in disease form. Oracle soon discovers it in digital form, an email sent to every single address on the planet that opens itself and reveals itself to everyone. Well, we always knew that spam was pure evil, but there you go. We cut to one month in the future. Wally and Barry emerge from the time stream, Barry rambling about how they failed to save Orion, plus how he was dead and even he's confused about how he came back. And so issue three ends with the two being confronted by Darkseid's new female furies. Wonder Woman, Batwoman, Giganta, and Catwoman. I admit I'm a little iffy on the idea of Wonder Woman submitting to the anti-life equation, because as powerful as it is, 
It's really just a form of mind control, and I could have sworn Diana was immune to that given the whole spirit of truth thing, but whatevs. We open issue four with a recap of what went down when the equation was spread across the world. Every cell phone, radio, GPS, basically anything that sent out a broadcast immediately transmitted it. Good news is that not everyone heard it, and some are just immune for a variety of reasons. Locations full of people, like the Hall of Justice, the orbiting Justice League Watchtower, Checkmate HQ, etc. Places that still have resistance fighters. Hell, even ordinary people have survived in places and are doing what they can. The Daily Planet set up shop in the Fortress of Solitude, thanks to Supergirl, and are printing off newspapers. You know, maybe we need to reevaluate print journalism being dead when 99% of the planet isn't reading it, but it's still being produced. The superhero known as the Ray arrives at the Hall of Justice with the Tattooed Man, the only other survivors there being Oracle, Green Arrow, Black Canary, Linda Park and her and Wally's kids, and Joan Garrick. Yeah, not exactly the Magnificent Seven. So the planet's all we've got now that all electronic media are broadcasting anti-life 24 hours a day. So nothing on TV's changed then. Over in Bloodhaven, Dan Turpin's been hooked up to several machines that are transforming his body. He's resisting as best as he can, not succumbing to the equation, but apparently that's part of the plan. This transformation requires a powerful spirit like his to be broken after a struggle. We see that the tiger creature that was being worked on was actually a new body for Calabac, Darkseid's son. And Turpin himself? Yeah, as he looks at himself in the mirror, it's revealed that they're turning his body into a new one for Darkseid. Look! Humankind's descent into the Forever Pit has begun! Bring on your glorious incarnation, Great One! Hallelujah! Yes, thank you, my servants. But could someone get me some moisturizer for my head? I'd like this new body to not have as many cracks in it. Also, get me some clear eyes for me's sake. This redness isn't for dramatic effect, you know. The tattooed man switched sides after this all went down, originally thinking the Dark Side Club was just some big criminal enterprise. The Ray is here because he can also act as a coordination system for transmission between the resistance cells. Also, despite Renee Montoya getting taken before the transmission was sent out, she's only now arriving at Checkmate. And there's a reason for that time discrepancy, explained by Alan Scott. Continuing on that idea that the new gods are literal gods, their living presence is distorting and compressing time around the Earth. Probably affecting space for that matter, too. My god! Time and space are becoming fluid! And that would mean that I didn't completely screw up last week when I said that the Hulk destroyed Los Angeles instead of Las Vegas, despite a sign for Las Vegas clearly in the background. <laughs> I mean, they're totally the same place now thanks to this. Meanwhile, the Flashes evade the female Furies as Barry continues rambling. Darkseid's falling, dragging this whole universe down as he goes. The entire structure of existence. The whole multiverse, Wally. One. How? Two. No, really, how is he doing that? Three, how do you know that, Barry? Hello? Anyone want to explain anything in more detail? Barry admits that some force reverse-engineered him back to life, presumably out of the Speed Force, considering we saw he had kind of merged with it during Infinite Crisis. Still, we get a moment where Wally and the two just hug, since it's been so long since they got to really be with each other. And you know, while I disagree with resurrecting Barry Allen, his return would be a good way to close out the Crisis Trilogy, as it were. I just wish it didn't feel like such an afterthought in all of this, where they couldn't even be bothered to explain how he was resurrected other than some vague, someone rebuilt me from particles and now I know stuff. Darkseid's forces break into the Hall of Justice and attack. Fortunately, they can use the teleporters to get up to the Watchtower in orbit, but Green Arrow elects to stay behind and wreck the equipment so they can't trace them. He's successful, but of course he's soon taken and a Justifier helmet put on him. In Bloodhaven, Darkseid's helmet is placed on his head. Give us a sign, great Darkseid! Thumbs up for the triumph of the human spirit! Or thumbs down to summon a day of holocaust that will never end! How about a middle finger? What would that signify? We see how regular humans are acting while under the equation, working in factories to produce justifier helmets, getting attacked, everyone wearing the same clothes, and of course transmissions of work, consume, die, judge others, condemn the different. Man, the aliens from They Live aren't even trying to hide it anymore, are they? Oh hey, the movie theater's showing Your Life is Anti-Life again. Third act wasn't great, but overall okay. 
Also, what's the point of transmitting these oppressive messages considering everyone's already under mind control anyway? Like, in the factory, there's a big banner that says, To die on the job is to die for Darkseid. Do they really need the motivational posters when they have no choice? Like, do they still get time off? Man, Darkseid's gonna make me work this weekend, I just know it. Stupid TPS reports. Barry and Wally go to rescue family first, so they find Iris, and Barry is able to free her from the anti-life equation with a kiss. Well, hey, if that works, we just need you two to kiss every person on the planet. And with super speed, that shouldn't take longer than a couple of days. Alan Scott, fighting alongside Hawkgirl, observes how things are getting worse. We get a new twist on the Red Skies idea. It's raining blood. Ugh, and I just got the car washed this weekend, too. At Checkmate HQ, the super young team, along with Mr. Miracle and Sunny Sumo, arrive in their flying car. Don't shoot! I'm Mr. Miracle, super escape artist! We can save the world! And someone shoots him in the chest. Ah, uh, Steve, you just shot our only hope. This is not gonna look good in your performance evaluation. And so issue four ends with Darkseid giving the thumbs down, Dan Turpin losing to Darkseid and condemning mankind. All in all, today's been a bit of a bummer, hasn't it, sir? Issue five begins with Hal Jordan's trial on Oa. Yeah, as I said, time is compressing on Earth, so it's moving faster there than in the rest of the universe. So they only just arrived for this. Hal has a scar on his head that he can't remember getting and no memory of where he was during the attack on Orion or Jon Stewart. Kraken claims that, like how he was possessed by Parallax, Hal is now host to one of Darkseid's minions. Fortunately, though, Guy Gardner and Kyle Rayner arrive to report that they can't get to Earth, and they suspect that the scar on Hal's head is hiding some kind of suppressor field device that is in turn hiding the new god's presence inside of Kraken. Despite the fact that the Guardians of the Universe don't really buy that idea, since the Alpha Lanterns were supposed to be impossible to be compromised, Kraken just shrugs and admits the whole thing. She fights off Kyle and Guy while revealing that this was just so she could get close to the central power battery and drain its willpower energy for Darkseid. Darkseid's unstoppable will in command of all this power! Think of all the chairs that Darkseid can sit on! All chairs belong to Darkseid! Somehow she knows that Metron was pointing humanity towards some ultimate technology and wonders if it's the power battery. Hal manages to not crack it out while the Guardians secure the central battery from being taken. Salak, the Green Lantern coordinator, orders Kraken put into a cell. And which new god is it that's possessing her? Granny Goodness! <laughs> oh, wait, it really is Granny Goodness. So it actually works this time. They very quickly exposit what's going on. Darkseid's fall, whatever the hell that means, is what's actually caused the time compression on Earth. But it's not limited to Earth. Some kind of singularity is forming with Earth at its epicenter, and all of reality is being sucked into it. Cracks in the universe are already forming in other space sectors. Hal is cleared of all charges and starts organizing a team to go back to Earth. You have 24 hours to save the universe, Lantern Jordan. Better pack a lunch. So despite the implication, it wasn't Shade that took Rene Montoya, it was Checkmate. It seems they've had a last-ditch plan in place for the day superheroes failed to save them. And it involves the multiverse. Higher up at Checkmate, Mr. Terrific takes charge before anyone else gets hurt. He's a little surprised that the super young team were able to find him since he's invisible to technology. Mother Box is more than a machine. If gods made iPods that were alive, way beyond that. They can hold way more songs! But their taste in music is pretty crappy. Fortunately, Mr. Miracle is just fine. He was wearing his impact-proof vest, so no harm, no foul. The castle is also under attack, and their shields will only hold for another 15 minutes, so Mr. Terrific isn't sure how they can help. In a last-ditch effort to try to cut this off at the source, Checkmate has dispatched a team of remaining superheroes to Bloodhaven to hopefully defeat Darkseid and his forces. This includes both Black Adam and Freddie Freeman, aka the former Captain Marvel Jr., who during this time had stepped up to become the Big Red Cheese. Mary Marvel is there to help Darkseid's forces defend it, but Black Adam looks into her eyes and sees that she too is possessed by a new god. Specifically, Darkseid's scientist slash creepy old man, Desaad. See, the only thing that confuses me about that is that Desaad apparently always wanted his hair to be pink and in pigtails. So I bet you're just dying to know what's happened to Nyx Wotan, right? Well, too bad. He's one of the few people who heard the anti-life equation, and it did nothing to him. 
Any of the few humans who are immune to it wind up in a cell before being experimented on. In the cell is a guy in a shroud and a guy in a wheelchair trying to solve a Rubik's Cube. The shrouded one explains the concept of the number of God, or rather, God's algorithm. The idea is that anyone trying to solve a Rubik's Cube using the fewest possible moves utilizes an algorithm when they do it. God would know how to solve a Rubik's Cube in any configuration using the smallest amount of moves. Mathematically, it's been proven that the smallest amount of moves necessary to solve it is 18. Nix Wotan doesn't give a crap about any of this. He figures they're all doomed, that there are no gods except Darkseid now. Now, the time for gods is done for sure. This is a time for something different. It's Miller time! Yeah, 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 not yet. 501st episode, I promise. The shrouded figure pulls out a piece of paper with that symbol Anthro is drawing on it. Nyx has just given up on all this, but the shrouded figure insists that he's the one who brought Darkseid to Earth and did all this, as an artist who imagined all these things. And if superheroes can't save the day, then as an artist he should be able to think of something that can save it. Yeah, this is weird and all, and it is going somewhere according to that theory I mentioned, but we'll talk about that later. Point is, the shrouded figure, who according to some Google searches is supposed to be High Father resurrected on Earth, much like the other new gods, says that Nyx has his true memories inside of him. He just needs something to trigger them. He recalls Ouija Dell and his memories start coming back. Darkseid's forces come to take him away, but then the figure in the wheelchair, a reincarnated Metron, solves the Rubik's Cube in only 17 moves. It pings like a mother box and stuff just explodes, taking out the guards. Confused yet? Well, don't worry. <laughs> it's gonna get worse. The way the heroes were able to contact each other despite all Earth-based communications being under Darkseid's control was through the Unternet, a villain-based internet that was revealed to the heroes thanks to a spy in Darkseid's forces. A super villain revealed it. Libra thinks the calculator did it, and they've dragged him to some gallows to be hung for the betrayal. He denies it, but Luthor and Dr. Savannah are also there to observe. Libra tells Luthor they're thinking of having Luthor lead a counterattack against the heroes. If you show willing, I might even let you be first in line with Supergirl. Hey, wait a second. I think these guys might be evil! Darkseid's other minions in the bunker start dying for some reason. Yeah, I know, it's part of the Batman tie-ins to this. They're trying to make a clone army of Batman because of reasons, and he manages to screw up their plans. But in the story, they just start dying for no reason. As Hal Jordan's team tries to breach the Singularity to get to Earth, Darkseid assumes direct control over those affected by the anti-life equation. Much like he used his will to subsist those on Kandor in the Great Darkness Saga, he's now basically directly linked with three billion people. When I command your surrender, I speak with three billion voices. When I make a fist to crush your resistance, it is with three billion hands. When I poop, it is with three billion butts. And with that pants crapping concept, yeah. All that momentum comes to a crashing halt because of utter confusion, since in Nick's Wotan's cell, he now reappears. Something new is born. The fifth world dawns in flame and thunder. Battle is joined. The judge of all evil is here. Ah, well, I'm sure they're going to explain what the hell that is. They never explain what the hell that is. 